Hello, and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the International Center for Sustainable Carbon. My name is Benedicta, and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, sustainable-carbon.org. Residents of our member countries and employees of our sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration on the website. Please type any questions you have in the questions box as we go along and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. The subject for today's webinar is Repurposing of Coal Assets, presented by Dr. Ian Reid. Over to you, Ian. Right. Thank you, Benedicta. And, uh, and hello and welcome to this uh, webinar on um, what we do with coal assets uh, uh, that um, are, are abandoned or closing. In the, in the last few years, I, I've reported on other uses for coal, covering gasification, new carbon products, mineral resources. But this, this webinar will look at our options for uh, projects in uh, coal installations. Uh, just a reminder of who we are. Uh, we provide independent analysis on the use of carbon and are partnered with the International Energy Agency and, and a Technology Collaboration Programme. Uh, so, um, the presentation today um, it, it, it arises because of the rapid program of closure in the coal industry in OECD countries as we withdraw fossil electricity generation and introduce renewable power. The, the first part of the energy transition was actually supported by gas and coal, but as, as these are withdrawn, a major issue has developed over the security of our electricity networks made more apparent following the invasion of Ukraine, and um, but a, an issue uh, as the renewable power supports more than half our grid. And per, this perhaps leads to an opportunity for our uh, closing coal installations. Uh, how are these relevant to the energy transition? Well, the question is perhaps, can these sites be advantaged in some way as locations for energy storage to hold surplus renewable energy until needed, or act as a home for alternative dispatchable power plants. And that will be the main theme of, of this webinar. I'm going to start uh, with coal mines, and then the second part of the webinar will be on power stations. Um, uh, let's um, just consider what's happening. And uh, th these pictures uh, on the left is last shift in an underground mine in the USA. And on the right is a surface mine in Scotland. Um, this picture was taken about 2008, I believe, uh, at the beginning of our restoration program. Now, often communities were closely linked with uh, coal mines, especially underground mines. So when that closes, it has a tremendous impact on the lo local population. But there are many other issues, um, legacy issues with uh, contaminated water, substance, hazardous structures, and abandoned kit. The, the sites need ongoing management in many cases, and that's difficult to fund unless they can be repurposed. So in the next section, we'll look at options for underground mines and in the energy storage sector and also uh, look at some, some of the work on land restoration. The first uh, technology I, I want us to look at is hydroelectric storage. Uh, the picture on the right is the um, uh, Dunnerwig power plant in Wales. Uh, it's also called the Electric Mountain. It's, um, it's a fantastic project. Uh, a, a reservoir at the top uh, releases water to a, to a turbine uh, uh, into a discharge lake uh, when power is needed. And um, then when uh, there's excess electricity, it um, pumps the water back up to the upper reservoir. This is a great system and rather beautiful uh, and capable of uh, delivering 300 megawatts for five hours. It, this is one of the of the first of these projects, but there are many installations, over 40 in the US alone. But to make a plant like this, you need a mountainous region, and it involves a vast excavation in, involving uh, 
in this case, about 12 million tonnes of rock and tunnelling and, uh, and, and preparation of reservoirs. So in a, in a new idea, um, the researchers are looking at an equivalent system called PUSH that may be fitted into an underground mine. And this is the picture on, on the left. The University of Michigan is assessing um, a nearby Mather mine, which is about a kilometre deep. And, and you need uh, distances of this order uh, to for a system like this. Um, it's the same principle as the network water flows down, powering the turbine when needed, and pump back when prices fall. The discharge reservoir is now underground, though, and uh, uses existing chambers, minimizing the excavation. The power available in this project is very similar to that in the Norwich, in principle, um, and power prices are estimated to be close to wind rather than battery storage prices, which are much, much higher. Uh, a mine survey for the US found many candidates uh, in the United States for a, a system like this, and the next step is a pilot, and uh, that project is in, in progress now. The next uh, technology I want to look at is compressed air energy storage, or CAES. Um, again, the idea is to use uh, underground chambers to store compressed gas, in this case, uh, until needed to power a turbine. Uh, this time, the gas is compressed by electricity uh, uh, in, when it's in surplus and fed to a turbine to generate power at peak times. The, the extra detail here is about um, the uh, managing the temperature as gases cool and expansion and heat and compression, which must be managed and it improves the efficiency of the system if you can use, use that energy. There are systems already in place for this technology um, that have worked very well. Uh, it, so it's not, it's not a, a, new, a new concept in that place but it's in competition with other technologies. And a major project in the United States, in Utah, was halted uh, recently in favor of a hydrogen storage facility, uh, a new billion dollar project. So uh, it emphasizes the competition for facilities that is emerging in this sector. Um, the, but the, this air technology could be generally applied in underground mines. And uh, I'd just like to, to, to mention that um, where we have underground mines, often we have power uh, stations that were located nearby. So, uh, so that helps um, the basis for the, these technologies, given the, the problems connecting to grids. Uh, the next one I want to look at is, um, is actually two technologies from Gravitricity. Um, uh, it's, it's a Scottish company um, developing uh, concepts for mine shafts. And uh, uh, if we take the one on the left first, which is um, concerned with uh, hydrogen storage in a mine shaft, uh, uh, as I've just said, hydrogen is uh, a hot news today. Uh, it, it may be that for heavy transport, uh, hydrogen is a, a better choice than uh, batteries. And, um, and that's going to require a major in infrastructure uh, investment, uh, as well as uh, the European Union's initiative in, in using hydrogen to decarbonize industry. Um, the I IEA says that investment in hydrogen is a multi-billion dollar opportunity. And uh, one of the um, uh, latest analysis uh, um, has uh, hydrogen power doubling very quickly. Now, now um, hydrogen will be actually used is uh, beyond my brief, but the idea is that we will generate hydrogen from new renewable power, accumulate and store it ready for use at a nearby filling station. And, and I think in the picture, you can even see a filling station here. Uh, hydrogen is a fugitive gas and difficult to store. Uh, there's an advantage in using a disused mine shaft. First of all, the walls can support the vessel, so it can be made with, with less materials, less thick, as, as the um, rock walls take part of the pressure, and, um, and the tank becomes more of a membrane. 
uh, and the maximum pressure is much higher if stored underground. It doubles to around 20 megapascals. Uh, a 10,000 meters tank can hold about 1,000 tons of hydrogen, or equivalent to about three gigawatt hours. And uh, there's, there is evidence for uh, this type of installation in that um, there's a facility in Sweden uh, using a salt cavern to hold a, a quantity of hydrogen it's similar in scale. Uh, if we move to the right-hand side picture, um, the other concept for mine shafts uh, from Garvatisti is shown on the right, where a heavy weight can be raised or lowered in a mine, uh, in a mine shaft, to store or generate electricity. Now, the electricity grid industry is betting heavily in battery storage. Tens of gigawatts are planned, but there are issues uh, with this approach, and these te these technology engineering engineered options for storing energy uh, avoid much of the issues with uh, el critical element supply, such as graphite, uh, cobalt, lithium, and so on. This the the potential energy system in a mine shaft, and these are you know perhaps 500 or 750 meters deep. Um, give a fast response time, switching from accumulation to discharge in less than a second, and perhaps uh, crucially, can offer almost 100,000 cycles, 75,000 cycles, compared to battery life at perhaps 8,000 cycles. So, this the, an installation like this could operate for decades. The basic gravity energy system would have a 500 ton weight and a 750 meter shaft. Uh, with uh, four synchronized turbine winches at the top. Uh, this pilot plant has been proven in Scotland, and the first commercial system is due to be installed in Chechia at the 700 meter deep Darkov mine. And that will be closely watched as this is a technology that could be deployed in many situations. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Gavin Edwards at Gravitisi for allowing us to use these diagrams. So, as you can see, the energy storage industry is really just getting underway. These are these are these are uh, relatively new projects. Um, but as our renewable power share has increased, we desperately need to be able to store energy that's generated in surplus. Often we have to pay uh, generators not to produce electricity. Uh, the next technology is um, geothermal. Uh, as you descend into deep underground mines, uh, the temperature rises uh, about 25 centigrade per kilometer. So in, in, in a um, uh, 700 meter deep uh, mine, the, the temperature of the water will be around 18 centigrade. And water it usually accumulates in mines, and uh, uh, often we have to pump that out. Uh, but in any case, there's a large reservoir of water that stays at a constant temperature. Now, we're, we're considering adding heat pumps to our network as we withdraw from gas power. But there are issues with uh, air, air heat pumps, not just their high cost, uh, but um, their, their operation when temperatures fall uh, below zero for, for air heat pumps. Uh, using uh, mine water, which is really meant, it really holds that constant temperature, avoids these, these issues. And also larger systems can be used that, uh, that are more, more efficient per household. Uh, the diagram shows a heat pump drawing uh, heat from mine water and delivering that to a district heating scheme. One project I looked at is near the Barredo colliery in Spain that has water at a constant temperature of 23 centigrade. In this case, the water had to be pumped out anyway, so the extra costs are in distribution of uh, the heated circuit and, um, and the heat pump installation, uh, which is it costs around one and a half million euros. The, the system provides about five megawatts of, of heat, in, in, enough for a local hospital and other other uh, key buildings. Uh, an installation in, in Holland can return warm water in the summer to the reservoir 
so that the system acts like a heat battery, uh, offering cooling as well as heating. So, so whereas uh, in the winter the, uh, the, the we need these these high temperatures, in, in the summer we can reverse the system um, and uh, uh, act as for air conditioning as well, which would be very advantageous in 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 the, in the future. Uh, a wine merchant using mine water to maintain the ideal temperature conditions in his warehouse. Uh, heat pumps need some electricity to drive them, about a quarter of the output. Uh, and this has been an issue uh, with natural gas, uh, which is about a quarter of the price of, uh, of electricity, or at least it has been in the past. Um, uh, but there are a lot of possibilities for this technology. Uh, you just need an underground mine nearby. And, and another uh, aspect is um, where we have uh, water, water uh, accumulation, lakes near, near old mines or uh, at ash ponds near coal power stations. So I'm sort of drifting towards the coal power uh, a little bit. Uh, there are many projects installing solar panels over ash, ash ponds, where a 60 hectare site provides about 100 megawatts capacity. Now, this, this um, 100 me megawatt installation in the picture uh, uses around 300,000 solar panels uh, in, in China. So it gives an idea of the, of the scale of the, these kinds of projects. Um, the, the water is uh, uh, contaminated, but can maintain the temperature of the of the panels to operate more efficiently. Uh, for uh, dry coal ash pits, there are more considerations, such as settlement and load bearing for the solar panel structure. Uh, at Shawnee Power Plant in Kentucky, a 120-acre site uh, will be uh, tarf before putting the uh, panels in place. Um, and that, that is a $220 million project for 100 megawatts uh, capacity. Um, and that's part of a massive 10 gigawatt solar program uh, in, in, in the US. And finally, before we leave mines, um, I just want to mention the restoration projects that are taking place. Uh, the understanding on how these sites can be restored is advancing. Uh, with uh, re really well uh, prepared strategies uh, to, to restore plant diversity and uh, dealing with uh, poor soil conditions and so on. This example at Wigan Flashes is uh, from um, adjacent to the former Westwood power plant in the UK. And these, these uh, ponds are act are actually, were actually formed from subsidence in coal mines uh, over many decades. Uh, but now this is a valuable nature reserve, uh, home to a number of rare plants and animal species, and is, is one of many such projects now. Uh, what to be, appear to be a blighted region has become an important communal space, and this, uh, this rewilding has been replicated across Europe and the USA. I, I hope I've given an impression of what is possible with mines, and the second part of the webinar will now look at power plants. Of course, uh, many sites have already been cleared, uh, such as uh, this one in Oxfordshire, the Didcup power plant. But if you if you look at this, you can you can start to see uh, what facilities we might re reuse. Um, unfortunately, there was a tragedy in demolishing the, 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 this uh, the turbine hall in the, at this power plant. Um, and, uh, it, it, in the center, of course, the, the turbine hall itself uh, is, uh, uh, can be a, an important large uh, space. Um, uh, we have uh, water uh, treatment, uh, we have ash pits, uh, we have um, uh, buildings, and most importantly, we have right in the center of the picture, we have the uh, transmission system and uh, 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 transformers uh, connecting to the grid. And this is key for all the technologies I'll, I'll talk about next. Uh, this site also has um, a gas uh, power plant uh, on the left, uh, which is still still in operation. And, uh, um, and, and we will also talk about uh, 
multiple generation schemes at, uh, at former coal stations. So I'm going to talk about batteries first. Um, in, this, in this case, the picture on the right is the, um, uh, meg, uh, the big battery project at uh, Wallerang. Um, uh, this using Tesla's uh, Megapack system, uh, it's lithium battery technology. Uh, the important part of the plant for 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 BESS is the uh, tr transmission system uh, that's still uh, the high high voltage transmission system is still present at the plant and that can be used to connect straight in the the big battery um, can supply or will be able to supply about 500 megawatts of electricity so it's of a of a scale uh, similar to the original power plant but of course uh, limited in time. Um, the advantage of, of, of putting a, a new electricity production system in place, an energy storage system in place, of course, is you can now manage the site uh, and uh, restore the site in a more managed way. Um, lithium uh, is our, our lightest metal and offers the largest charge density of, of our battery chemistries. And, and this is the attraction um, for um, for well, for the electricity transmission uh, systems across the world, uh, see, see lithium batteries is the easiest way to put in energy storage. But there are issues because they need not just lithium, but cobalt, graphite, and nickel, and all all these elements are uh, going to be in very short supply, um, uh, and are needed in another factoring. And of course, there's a major political issue that China has a near monopoly position on the materials and the production of batteries. Uh, we, we are looking at a, a, a number of uh, giga factories to make batteries in Europe and, and the United States, but China already has 100. So the fear is the cost of these installations is set to rise and will be dependent on, on China for materials. Uh, and that's why there's interest in, in the engineering energy storage technologies I've been presenting this morning. Uh, there's another type of battery, a, a flow battery. Um, and this, uh, uh, unlike uh, lithium, uh, there's a much uh, smaller um, energy storage available in these batteries, uh, but um, they can deliver uh, power uh, for a longer time. Um, so, a much lower power target, uh, 10 megawatts, but supplied for 100 hours. So this becomes a, a solution for uh, smaller com communities, perhaps, um, but covering uh, you know, low wind uh, periods of up to a week, perhaps. To give a, an idea on scale, um, there are about 50 uh, meter cube cells to a stack and the picture shows how many are needed for this uh, 10, 10 uh, uh, megawatt system. Uh, I think it's about 10 megawatts per hectare. And again, we, sh we show the uh, solar panels and, uh, and wind farms that would supply the uh, excess uh, electricity to charge the batteries. Uh, these, these, uh, there is a new development in, in these um, uh, redox systems as a new sulfur phosphorus uh, chemistry being developed for flow batteries is also it perhaps hold a higher higher charge density the, the other advantage of um, adopting uh, the, the uh, something like the iron ox oxidation battery is that they're more like AA batteries they're, they're non flammable whereas lithium cells uh, the, the preferred solution it can deteriorate over time and if they overheat uh, they have their own oxygen to sustain a fire. And that's that's why you have to distribute the, the batteries in, in an installation. In fact, I think it was a faulty battery pack that's caused the Fremantle highway ship disaster, carrying 3,000 vehicles, and, uh, with, and 20, 25 of which were electric vehicles. 
Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the salt battery. And, and what's I find interesting on, on, on this one is that it, it un, unlike the, the uh, BESS installations, uh, the battery installations that only really uh, seek to use the transformer and, and uh, high voltage transmission lines, um, the, the salt water, uh, so, uh, molten salt battery, uh, uses a, a quite a significant part of a power plant. And um, and uh, like the other storage schemes, that, so the, the salt reservoir is heated with excess power. And, and in this diagram, the EIMS heater is what's heating the, the molten salt. It's a, a mixture of uh, sodium potassium nitrates, quite a mixture. Uh, the attraction of this technology is that the salt heat capacity is very large and a plant like this can release power um, for um, of the same magnitude as the as in the original station which in this example uh, was was a 500 megawatt plant and it, and is intended to cover the night period when solar energy is unavailable or or, or a sustained low wind period depending on the mix of renewable power supplying the plant uh, the salt heat exchangers uh, shown here in the center uh, are linked to the original plant system turbine system uh, steam and turbine system so these are reused and of course are already connected to the grid the plant we can't use in a salvage is shown on the left the, the coal milling uh, gas cleanup uh, right through to the stack are all redundant and and um, and th this plant is a relatively new one, so there's a good chance for um, uh, re repurposing some of this equipment. Uh, the, the project I've been looking at is based in Chile, the Jenner Andamos uh, plant, um, and it's uh, the, the coal station is set to close to meet net zero plans, but uh, it's going to adapt to this molten salt energy storage facility. The cost is similar to the Australian uh, battery plant I showed you earlier at around uh, half a billion dollars, but with a longer supply time at full capacity, uh, easily 12 hours, uh, with the salt starting at around its top temperature of 565. I mean, one of the management issues with a plant like this is the salt must not fall below uh, to 200 centigrade, uh, which would, would um, uh, lead to problems all around the system. So, so you have to maintain a minimum condition in the plant. Of course, a system like this would require a, a, a larger operating team than a battery installation. And that's partly why um, it, those are preferred by uh, transmitters. Uh, next, we're going to look at uh, energy hubs. Uh, of course, the issue with renewable energy is intermittency. And the idea of energy hubs is to have a range of power sources that can complement each other. Uh, the picture shows the solar array at Banner Ordos in, the, in, the, in the Mongolia, uh, part of a new plant that is solar, wind, battery, and, um, and, a, and also a, a new coal plant. The renewable sections is a capacity of around 12 gigawatts, mostly solar power, but but wind around four gigawatt capacity, while the coal station is sized around four gigawatts. So on an average basis, the, the coal station will provide about half the power. This is aimed at ensuring dispatchable power, and it uses storage to maximize the benefit of, of renewables, but also to reduce the operational duress of the of the fossil plant uh, uh, operation as um, as we know these have been starting to cycle uh, quite severely to cope with uh, uh, variation in renewable in renewable power uh, the plant on the right is the Herm power plant in germany uh, the site is to be repurposed with a 650 megawatt gas power plant replacing a uh, 950 megawatt coal station but it will also have a new lithium battery storage plant uh, initially sized around 20 megawatts so that's around 
uh, 10 2 megawatt shipping containers. So they're a relatively small uh, battery installation to begin with. But in addition, uh, hydrogen electrolyzers will uh, be powered by renewable energy, and that and the hydrogen made from those will feed into the EU's new hydrogen distribution network. So the idea there is um, uh, is to use the pipeline to store hydrogen. Um, at Duisburg, another uh, mixed energy site, uh, electrolyzer will, will supply around 10 tons of hydrogen an hour into a nearby pipeline. The, these hub installations are more complex to operate as the fossil, fossil fuel station is still there um, and batteries uh, have to balance renewables uh, to provide uh, a steady power supply as, as I, th I think the electro electrolyzers will need a steady uh, power supply to produce hydrogen as well. Um, that, that's one of the big question marks over the uh, uh, durability of electrolyzers. Um, now, these, some of these projects retain coal or biomass or gas power, uh, but when, when looked at in the overall scheme, the, the CO2 per megawatt is much lower than in a standalone coal station. Uh, in China has adopted uh, uh, coal, whereas obviously in the European Union uh, they want to eliminate coal as, as, the, uh, as, the, as, as the core dispatchable plant. Uh, I now I want to say a little bit about nuclear. Um, uh, a number of small nuclear stations are being considered. Um, they're, they're called small modular reactors, SMRs, and, uh, and the sites for these stations uh, are, are often uh, old coal station sites. Uh, and a, a number have been announced, especially in the United States, um, and, uh, but also in Europe, uh, Rho Power of Romania um, uh, at its uh, Deutschesti coal station as, as a, a mixed nuclear renewables hub in preparation. The, the picture is an artist's impression of what um, a, a Rolls-Royce SMR station would look like with a pressurized reactor in the center. This technology is really a development of that already used on ships and submarines. So it's a substantial track record. Uh, in all, there are 70 different designs of development and already some 300 megawatt scale units are operational in China and Russia. At that scale, um, the plants are similar to older coal power plants, so, so fit well into, into our region. And at slightly smaller capacity than, um, than you know, the latest coal station designs, uh, perhaps fit better with a renewables um, uh, dispatchable power system. The SMR can use much of the existing infrastructure from the coal station, um, and like the others, the, the most important part is the grid connection. In fact, in fact, um, connecting to transmission grids is one of the major barriers to uh, installing new wind farms and solar power, power farms. Uh, but a nuclear station could use the air and water treatment systems from the original plant, and um, and, uh, and the scale is more suitable. Uh, for the local region than the uh, typical large-scale nuclear stations that, uh, that, that are normally built. The uh, idea as well is that when you fabricate uh, perhaps 10 of these stations, uh, there will be considerable savings in, uh, in design and fabrication uh, compared to a, a bespoke plant. Uh, there are concerns, though. Um, Unless several units are co-located, then the same support staff might be needed as for a large reactor. The economics require a significant number to be made. Um, the issue of nuclear waste is at the top of concerns, as some uh, analyses indicate more waste per megawatt than conventional units and a shorter lifespan due to the smaller scale and neutron leakage. However, uh, Regular, uh, there, there is um, 
uh, evidence from marine nuclear as a basis for assessing uh, these designs. Uh, in all the cases, coal stations have been identified as uh, ideal sites for, for these developments. Um, there's also uh, nuclear fusion, and there have been advances uh, in the last year on the um, development of commercial uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, for the first time, um, more energy has been generated than supplied in fusion uh, reactors, but, but the times uh, the time of generation remains extremely short in, in the seconds uh, uh, the seconds range. And um, uh, but the, but one of the first uh, commercial pilot plants is uh, be, uh, is to be installed at a former coal station for all the reasons we've been discussing. Uh, so that that is something for the future. Uh, and last, uh, I just want to finish with some headline projects in in the in the sort of cultural sector. Uh, Battersea Power Station in London has recently been redeveloped into an iconic destination in London. It hasn't been straightforward and, and the cost has been over 10 billion, but the power plant arch architecture has been retained in the, in the shopping and office development that houses Apple's European headquarters, with the US Embassy shown in the, in the top of the picture. The other is the Tate Modern Museum in London, essentially retains the original exterior of the Bankside power plant uh, that closed in 81. The turbine hall was cleared and refitted for a new art gallery. And this is now one of London's top tourist attractions. So for, for these power stations located in cities, there are um, important examples of here of what can be done. And, uh, and actually, they retain uh, architectural details that add to the interest and while retaining our industrial heritage. So I'm coming to the end, just a few remarks. Um, the need for energy storage has really only emerged as the share of renewables has risen and intermitt intermittency has become an energy security concern. Uh, we, we've um, heard a lot about very cheap uh, wind and solar power and, and, and the prices of generation have definitely fallen, especially with uh, China's mass production. Uh, but it really, we need to look at generation and storage from now on. Um, we've looked at a suite of uh, options for underground sites that uh, offer energy storage without a large demand for critical elements. And this may be critical for this sector. Uh, it's fairly new, but energy designs, uh, including the gravitational potential energy designs of uh, uh, the look of uh, uh, weights and shafts and so on, uh, compressed air and hydropower, uh, hydropower not requiring uh, mountainous uh, geography, uh, and also hydrogen storage underground so that we can uh, store much more hydrogen in, a, in, a, in, 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 in smaller vessels. And also the geothermal energy using heat pumps which uh, has a, uh, is really uh, gaining traction um, as uh, quite, a, quite a number of coal uh, power stations uh, supply district heating and that is being lost. And uh, so we're looking for alternatives. Uh, for coal stations, we looked at batteries. Uh, this is a favorite solution from electricity grids, uh, the lithium battery uh, solution. Uh, and they can use uh, the uh, uh, electricity uh, transmission system attached to coal stations. Uh, but we've also discussed the concerns over supply of critical metals for, for these and the fact that China is dominating their production. Uh, and we looked at energy hubs that use multiple electricity sources with energy storage to make for a more durable electricity supply. And, uh, and also these uh, can make hydrogen that can be used to fuel our heavy transport in the future. We've looked at sites uh, that are converted to cultural destinations. Oh, uh, yeah. um, and the rewilding of coal mines and power plant sites that are proving valuable to maintaining nature diversity 
well offering new parklight to communities. Actually, we're, I think we're getting much better at doing this. So repurposing can just mean a scrapping and clearance of perhaps a more valuable development that supports the energy transition. Thank you for listening, and I'll, we'll try and answer any questions you have on repurposing. Oh, this is the, this is the slide I meant to show. <laughs> uh, yeah, this um, this uh, um, final picture here is of the uh, Zolveren coal mine in Essen, which has become the uh, starting point for the um, uh, industrial heritage trail in Germany. And if you look, you can see the uh, the coal conveyor, the coking plant, and the iconic shaft that's become the symbol of Essen. And it's just an example of, of, of uh, how these sites can be transformed into uh, places of great interest to, um, to, our, uh, to our communities. Right, thank you for listening, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Good, thank you so much, Ian. Um... Let me just see what we have. There's a question here. How does hydrogen hydrogen electrolysis fit in with repurposing coal sites? Uh, yeah, uh, I think they fit they fit um, um, in in two ways. I, I talked about uh, using uh, shafts so they can have uh, uh, th thinner walled vessels contained in shafts that uh, are, are cheaper to uh, install but also if underground we can double the hydrogen pressure and uh, electrolyzers are uh, basically a, a, an option um, against uh, batteries for storing energy but when you when you make uh, hydrogen then um, uh, you can use that in a, in a similar way to fossil fuels i mean the J jcb are planning um, hydrogen internal combustion engines for the, for their equipment rather than fuel cells, which have proved rather sensitive. Um, and uh, that, that could fit with an energy hub uh, approach. It, in China, that energy hub would be uh, based on coal, on a, on, a, on a new coal plant, high efficiency coal plant. Uh, whereas in Europe, that might be based on gas or biomass, uh, uh, biomass uh, uh, refitting a coal station uh, to form the, the, the basis for, for that hub. So um, uh, that's how they fit with coal stations. Okay, fascinating. Um, here's another one. Why should we look beyond battery storage to support electricity grids? Uh, yeah, uh, I think I uh, alluded to um, the materials that are being used to make our lithium batteries. We, we need cobalt, we need lithium, uh, we need graphite. Um, China dominates the graphite market, and um, uh, um, oh, uh, real, uh, cobalt mining is problematical from uh, the DRC. Uh, lith lithium uh, production is uh, about a thirtieth of what it needs to be at the moment, so there's a, a, a supply issue. Um, so um, looking at engineered solutions, uh, avoids uh, the, uh, uh, what could be really, really high price rises in these materials. The cost cost of storage may may really increase. Yeah. And there's another one here called uh, SMR or SMR at 300 megawatts uh, with reference from submarines. How long? How large is a submarine reactor? Yeah, this this is a little bit larger than a submarine reactor, uh, but actually um, the uh, designers are really mo more looking to downsize from large large designs. Uh, the uh, the Terra Power reactor, for instance, uh, is, is designed for I think the smallest one's twelve hundred megawatts, and they're they're rescaling that for the three hundred megawatt scale. And that that reactor is interesting because it uh, um, has a molten uh, salt design that allows energy storage as well as um, uh, providing a, a, a efficient uh, energy. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ian. Um, I think that's all we, 
we've got time for today. Right, um, okay. All that's left for me to say is uh, the slides from this webinar will be available as always to download from the webinar page on the website shortly. And uh, next month's webinar from us will be on the 13th of September on the potential of carbon utilization in the net zero emission economy presented by Dr. Chen Su. Thank you all for joining us today and goodbye. Yeah, thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.